Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. The original reason I wanted to have you on this show is because, well, we're basically the same age, we're only born a few days apart, mm. uh, born in November 1989, which... Oh, when we were born, the the East Germans they were they didn't wait for the Berlin Wall to be or get the uh, demolish demolish uh, trucks in to to remove it. They got whatever picks and axes, whatever they they tore it down themselves. Hmm. And they'd been suffering in the the Eastern European under communism post World War Two, and basically, well, they well they weren't there was no famines, but basically. The most obvious one is that there was not much food. Obviously, you didn't have free political communication. And that was obviously at the time, 1999, considered a, a watershed moment that, his, that communism was falling. And that's when China, even though it's still ruled by the Chinese Communist Party, abandoned the communist system. And eventually Vietnam did. But obviously, 30 years later, communism is back. And... A lot of that subversion has happened during our lifetime. Obviously, we were what, young children during the, the 1990s. And during that time, it's fair to say that the nuclear family, mother, father, children, were still in place. There wasn't too much divorce. I remember when I was at school, if it, it was the exception that a child, their, their parents were divorced. And everyone sort of was like, oh, that's a bit different. Your parents are, are divorced. It's... That's what I remember at the time. It was basically family and life structure were much simpler. Yeah. Uh, where I grew up in Frankston, divorce was, uh, I wouldn't say common, but I wouldn't say uncommon either. I mean, there were a lot of single parents in Frankston, but there were a lot of parents that were still together too. My parents stayed together. Uh, for that, I'm grateful. Uh, but yeah the concept of family has definitely changed is a nice way of saying it a more really a, a more objective way of putting it would be to say that it's degraded or even been subverted but communism never fell with the berlin wall communism in its physical form was a charade it was a, a circus performance real communism is, institu is an institutional power it's a psychological influence it's not physical. It's not an army. Well, they had to, it's fair to say, regroup for a, for a number of years because uh, certainly I, it's fair to say that, that Lee Rhiannon, who was a Green senator for a number of years, uh, she was, during the, the Cold War, she was a, a Stalinist. Mm. She, she was a member of the Socialist Party of Australia, which was a pro-Stalinist party, and she edited a, a newspaper right up until the fall of the... The Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was a, a, a basically a Soviet shilling publication, mm -hmm. but after that she joined the Australian Greens after the Soviet Union collapsed, which mm -hmm. it took them a while to to regroup, but they were certainly down and out for at least a, a few years. Uh, obviously, now you mentioned obviously Frankston, uh, where you grew up in the nineties. It's it had quite a, a bad reputation. There was uh, Sarah McDermott who disappeared from from Cannonock Station. She was never to be seen again. And then there was the uh, the serial killer uh, Paul Denyer who killed uh, three uh, girls in the the early nineties, which obviously freaked a lot of people out. And well, the the end result of that was well. Even today, Frankston is still the butt of a lot of jokes. I mean, Trevor Marmalade and Dave Hughes, they make was that endless Frankston joke along with Adelaide jokes as well. It's, I would say it's certainly become a bit more gentrified uh, since then, but it's still, you could describe, it's still fair to describe it as a, as a rough place, but it was, it was also still, and it still is, uh, largely white old Australia and so is the Mornington Peninsula as well which it's adjacent to yeah definitely uh, the whole southeast of Melbourne hugging Port Phillip Bay is still predominantly white inland where all the new development homes are cheap new homes 
built in what was essentially swampland uh, before the developers bulldozed it all. Uh, that's where all the new immigration is being brought into. And I remember, for example, Cranbourne, which is a suburb just inland from Frankston, where I grew up. Frankston is up against Port Phillip Bay. Just inland in Cranbourne, all white Australians too when I was growing up. Probably even a bit rougher than Frankston, actually. We used to fight the Cranbourne boys when we were younger but on the weekends. But now Cranbourne is basically an Indian and Pakistani enclave. Yes, and uh, don't take our word for it. The Age actually wrote that recently, that it was basically the place where Indians are settling in Melbourne. Yeah, and the only real difference you see in Frankston now, the majority of Frankston is a is populated by white working class families still. The impact of drugs and social degeneracy is worse now than it was when I was growing up. Uh, there's more homeless, homelessness, there's more uh, disadvantaged families, there's more children roaming the streets on their own in the middle of the day, late at night. It's, it's a bizarre place. But during the summer in particular, a lot of the immigrants from inland come to the beach. Yes, and I've seen that as well when and, I had a barbecue at the, the Frankston Foreshore. Yeah, and it, it basically, at the Frankston Foreshore, it, it basically looks like little India there during the summertime because they all come there to swim and to to hang out with their families. But that's demographically the main change. But uh, yeah, all the southeast, as I said, up against hugging Port Phillip Bay of Melbourne is still predominantly white. Mostly, I think it's really highly densely populated now too. Like when I was young, I remember going to the shop, whether it was to Woolworths with my family or to the video shop, you know, before DVDs, it was easy. It was not a headache. It didn't, it wasn't crowded. There was no traffic. Now it's almost impossible. And everyone's so frustrated. There's no time. And there's so many people in Mornington even, and even further south from Mornington down in places that used to just be holiday places where people had holiday houses, you know, all down towards Sorrento. It is so packed. This is because the white Australian population has run away from all the inland developments. They've moved closer to the Port Phillip Bay, to the, to the foreshore. And, and basically there's nowhere for them to go now unless they're going to pick up and move across the other side of the city or maybe to Ballarat or, or further out. If they're going to remain there in, in a, and live in a culture which at least resembles what Australia once was, the Australia that they grew up in, uh, you know, European Australia, they're going to have to stay as close as they can to Port Phillip Bay and avoid going inland because inland is no longer Australia. You wouldn't want to send your children to, I'd say, any school today because obviously there's the Safe Schools program, they've been indoctrinated into the climate change religion where, well, they're basically terrified that the world's going to end because of a apocalyptic climate change in, was it 10 years? And oh, we also see the or the history that they're taught is that uh, white people are responsible for for all the 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 social uh, injustices and uh, war war genocide crimes all throughout the the world. But I recall the history that Australian history, which of course we see the Invasion Day rallies every year now. The the his, Australian history that I got taught is that well, colonial Australia when. Europeans settled that that was a positive thing that helped build the the nation of today and we weren't taught taught about indigenous culture but it was a complementary thing we weren't it wasn't like it sort of is now that there's this racial tension it was just that oh there, there was also these these native people oh there was obviously a bit of trouble earlier on but and there's been reconciliation now and now it's it's all sweet yeah uh, I can I can mostly agree that that was how it was. We did learn a lot about Aboriginal culture. Like we dressed up like Aboriginals when we were in prep in primary school. We wore like rags and stuff and painted our faces and we used to make didgeridoos. Uh, we learned about the first fleet and what was essentially, you know, the, the start of the colonization of Australia and the, Euro the European settlement. But we didn't learn about it as though it were a negative thing, as you said. Like we learned about it as though it was just a fact of history, and it's it's how it's how Australia came to be, the, the Australia that the we that we hail from. But uh, but yeah, like uh, 
obviously the uh, education curriculum was not as heavily politicized back when we were kids as it is now and it's the typical tune of a Pied Piper of a propagandist to oversimplify the hell out of everything and blame everything on one enemy you know Adolf Hitler said that uh, it belongs to the leader of genius to make many different evils appear as though they belong to one category and that's exactly what modern Marxism does white men are the responsible for everything and every idiot out there simplistic enough to believe it follows along with the Pied Piper you know maybe it's time to think a little bit more about what you think you know if you're one of those people now the white australia policy began to be dismantled in 1967 then it was in the late 70s that what the what you'd call waves of, of non-white migrants began to to arrive in australia and obviously in the early 90s uh, there was it you wouldn't say it was a flood like there is now which meant that migrants whether they came from asia or uh the middle east or or or, or the subcontinent they because they were coming to what was predominantly european cultural country they to fit in they had to assi assimilate which assimilation shouldn't be a dirty word and i went to school with a few not, uh, obviously down on the peninsula is uh, majority white but uh, the ones who are non-white they were basically well because they needed to be assimilated they were basically no different from us even the the asians that i knew probably more in my teenage years like for example if you talk to them on the phone you wouldn't know that they're asian like mm. they, they spoke like an aussie but what we're certainly seeing now with not just uh, not just floods of migrants but and especially with the internet these days you you don't need to basically go out and integrate in your community you can just get your was it hindi or mandarin tv and just basically live ba basically you're a virtual citizen of still your your home country and so we're seeing and this is what schools have become there's they've now gone back to basically having the social groups as just basically racial and religious tribes. Yeah. There was only one Indian kid at our school that I remember. Every other kid was white at my primary school in Frankston. And he was one of our mates. Like, we didn't see him. We knew he was different, obviously, but he didn't behave differently. He was actually really funny. He had a good reputation with all the boys because he was funny. And I suppose at... Uh, from that point of view or th that level of immigration maybe assimilation is a possible thing you know you can become spiritually white australian even if you're not white at that point but uh, i don't know what school's like now but i can't imagine it's like that anymore it seems i see the kids walking home from school around the area where i live and there seems to be huddles of chinese kids and then huddles of black kids and then huddles of indian kids everything's extremely racial tribal now like picture like an american style prison tv program where it's you know races basically only associate with members of their own kind it seems to be the result of our beautiful diversity and harmonious multicultural society that's legislated into state law so i don't see how that's making us stronger i've yet to see a single example but you know all the evidence points to the opposite but i feel for the kids going to school these days don't know what it'd be like and of course it's so easy for young children at school now to have written in their their permanent record which is sort of a de facto police record that uh, they made what we believe is a racist sexist uh, yeah, yeah. comment this is actually that reminded me i have a couple of friends who have kids going to school and i think that the school system directed by whoever's controlling the curriculum is using children to inform on their own parents they ask children to take home homework projects and they're supposed to do them with their family and some of the questions on the projects are why is multiculturalism good for australia and uh how does diversity benefit australia stuff like that and the parents are supposed to answer the questions with the kids and then the kid takes it back to the school which is very it, it's 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 I don't feel comfortable with that. Now, in China, uh, 
a way he 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 came up with a way of basically identifying and executing dissidents. He put out a big call once and said, "Anyone out there who's got better ideas about how we can run the government, write in with your name and address so we know you're a citizen, and tell us your ideas, and we'll take them into consideration." Everyone who wrote into the government ended up disappearing, you know, because they were thinking too much. And I think that this, you know, group family homework effort about diversity and how it benefits Australia as a way of getting children to inform on their parents and then into a government data system, maybe the details of potentially dissident families will get logged. And what I mean by dissident is white working class families who don't agree with multiculturalism. Yeah. Well, they have, well, it's not just safe schools now, there's the Respect for Relationships program, which is aimed at kindergarten to, it's basically a degendering program that yeah. pick up early signs of what's called toxic masculinity. Yeah, well, if, if I had a great deal of power and influence in a country that I hated, I'd be doing that to their children as well. Like, you know, you're not, you're not going to, if you're controlling the institutions in a country that you've targeted to either transmute into a giant corporation for your own profit, or you've basically marked it for extermination, you don't want the children growing up to be strong, proud members of a nation with traditions, with moral structure, morally healthy, physically healthy. You want to destroy them every way you can. So, you know, you can't really see it as unusual when every institution and, you know, powerful entity in our country is unfriendly and even outrightly, outrightly hostile. It's no surprise. Like anyone who looks at the safe schools program and people trying to turn your kids into transsexuals or genderless, like psychopaths or whatever they're trying to do to children, you can't be shocked by it because people that run the education system and your government in your country, if you're living in Australia or anywhere in the West, they hate you. They don't like you. So how can you be shocked that they're trying to destroy your children? Of course, that's what they're going to do. The question is, what are you going to do about it? It's fair to say that for me in the early 2000s, that's when I would say the, the education system's well, agenda started to rub off on me. Obviously, that was after September 11, there was the Iraq war, and there was all, that's when people started to burn effigies of, of John Howard and, and George uh, W. Bush. And basically, I felt that, uh, uh, reflecting on it now, that... Uh, the the school what, what we were sort of thinking being taught about and how we thought at school is basically like a q a episode how everyone agrees with us and we don't understand why people well at the time vote for john howard and, and george uh, w bush and and so that was basically because well it was probably because uh, i was going to school down on the mornington peninsula where we weren't affected by these social problems that it's easier to convince people who aren't affected by these diversity problems that we know now that this is what we need and it was also when i was in in vc that was when the the economy was allegedly booming and we were told that the the economic advancement that that had happened since the uh, since the the early 2000s was, was going to to last forever but of course uh, we saw the the stock market crash of 2008 uh we we saw, i went to, to to university study study commerce that's where uh julie gillard is education minister uncapped uh, university uh places which now university degrees are now pretty much worthless that we can pretty much use them a lot of them as, as toilet paper and the thing was they encouraged everyone to go to university at, at that day because that was the, they said the key to success and of course what they created was a a skills shortage in the the actual trades and so then uh, of course they they're, they're trying to correct that now you went down the 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 trades route but of course it's it's common knowledge that, that in your youth uh, you spent time in in prison for various offences and that's been documented in other appearances that you made but i don't think what you've ever been asked before is like when when you were released from from prison, how did you how, how did you rebuild your life back then? Obviously, you're young, but it was also because, of course, this is the digital age where every sort of employer likes to do a criminal background check. Like, for example, if you're what if you're because how it used to work if you studied a university degree and you became accredited, if you had a serious criminal record, uh, they they deny you uh, the accreditation. 
So uh, obviously with the with the trades, it's it's different. But how did you find it? Obviously, getting back on your feet. It wasn't that hard, really. Like, I work hard, so people seek me out, and my family's been in the building industry for generations. So it's we've got a reputation. The last name is known in my area. My my last name. But I don't work for anyone. I've never tried to really be employed by a third party corporation that requires any sort of background check, you know, because I don't want to work for anyone. I just want to trade my skill that I learned when I was young with a client for an agreed amount with as little interference from a third party as possible. I'll pay tax because I have to, or I'll go to jail. Um, but that's it. Like, it's really quite simple. If you just work hard, and you put yourself out there, you make some business cards, you advertise yourself in whatever way you can, people will seek you out. Like, it's really actually really hard for anyone to get a decent carpenter or a plumber to come out to their house to do something these days. Like, as you know, you want well, to... Well, that's, that's <laughs> why there was that 457 visa program to get, because mm. that, that was the other part of my question. They, in this uh, 2000s economic boom, it's like, oh, if you want to make lots of money, the best way to is go to university, get a get a degree and it was really during that or oh, it's it's still the case today but basically being a, a tradie was demonized that's only what uh, drop kicks in school do yeah socially it was however there was government programs to assist us as well uh there wasn't a lot but i remember we got a tool grant i think when you when you were officially signed on as an apprentice you were given like six to eight hundred dollars to spend on tools that's all we got. And I still have a couple of tools that I bought with that grant, like, I don't know, what, 10, 12 years ago or something like that. So, or maybe 13 years ago. No, it would have been 15 years ago now. Yeah, forget how old I am. But yeah, like, uh, it's, there is classism in Australia. There really is. And it's, it's actually not uh, the fascist bourgeoisie against the proletariat communist <laughs> working yeah. class the opposite is the case mm. there's a communist political class so-called academia and media elites against the very patriotic working class that's the classism that i experience and that every worker in this country experiences we're basically looked down on because we work with our hands by these so-called intellectuals who all consider themselves socialists or something similar and yeah. what Marx wrote about, about the, the working class rising up, if it actually occurred in the, the way that he wrote, it would be a very different... Result. Well, yes. Yeah. And... Well, every effort's been made by these elites to prevent a working class rise. They pretend they're all for workers' rights, but then when any worker actually stands up and demands that some of his rights be recognised, uh, he's smashed down as a racist Nazi. You know, so it's, it's, it's really paradoxical but you can see it makes sense uh if you look at it from their perspective because they're just liars they basically just take what is actually happening flip it upside down and explain it to you backwards and expect you to believe them like that's they, the way communists have always operated i suppose <clears throat> uh, university for me i went to, to monash caulfield uh, which obviously is a fair distance away from the the mornington peninsula but it's actually, ironically, my experience at university, that's what red-pilled me on a lot of the, the cultural issues because, as I mentioned, during the, the 2000s, I was basically uh, at school, like, accepted the, the left, cultural left consensus. But well, what I basically found out at university, and it, 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 was, it was shared by a lot of people that basically the... I would say the the cultural divide was it, it was true like the the asian students beha like behaved in a, in a certain way so did the the indian students and obviously being closer to the city you see some of these uh integration problems that you weren't you didn't see down on the the mornington uh, peninsula and so it was actually that's what actually made me more of a, a realist in the in the world my, my university experience which i don't think any many people can sort of i don't i don't see integration problems when i go into melbourne i see a total ethnic replacement like if you've got all right you want to talk about integration right if you've got let's say 80 percent 
Australian you know, you know people I'm saying like, that word ironically. Yeah, yeah, I know too. Yeah, yeah, but like, what is integration at the end of the day? Is it if if we arrive at a point in the future where ninety five percent of Australia is Asian, African, Indian, and Arabic, but they're all voting for Australian political parties, obeying Australian law, and wearing Australia pride hats, is that integration? No, it's not. It's ethnic replacement. It's a genocide process, and it can't be looked at as anything else unless you're a communist and it's in your interest to rule over a bunch of idiots instead of a homogenous nation of proud and strong people. But, uh, yeah, if you've got a country that is, you know, got various different cultures bunching up into little cliques and living in their own separate communities and speaking their own separate languages, oh, and divide and conquer, isn't it? It's a perfect system for any for any uh, tyrannical form of government. Well, what you've just said, it's an observation. Of course, it's called racist, but like you didn't make it that way. You're just observing what is happening. And there's a famous quote by uh, Ludwig von Mises, who was an Austrian economist, where he, taught, he was referring to the failures of socialism. And he's like, this is not the way that I want it, but it's the way that it is, which basically... You're being a realist. You're not a denialist. I've always said that I don't have views. I mean, when you say you've got views and these are my views, you're suggesting that you're perceiving something as the way you want to see it, not the way it is. I don't have views. I'm just seeing things. I'm making observations and then explaining what my observations are. I mean, you might say, oh, that's your view. But this, this is not the way I want things to be. It's the way it is. Yeah. No, like, for example, like, I wish that the Sudanese uh, Australian community were, was able to harmoniously integrate. Like I would, I would love that, but that's not what's happening. And you've got to be a realist about how, using that particular example, obviously, the, uh, the African youth crime wave has, uh, has hit Melbourne in the last two summers. And uh, there was, of course, the, the, the Secure rally because that was a, a crime hotspot. It's these, like, these are real crimes that are happening by, or well, they're committed by real perpetrators with real people. It's, it's what's happening. It's not, it's not made up. No, and it's no coincidence or mistake either. It's part of a destabilization process. Like, uh, it's, it's, it's being done deliberately. It's not a mistake. This is what I can't stand hearing from people. They should be wiser than this. Regular people should know what's happening by now. Like, the government hasn't made a mistake when they legislated multiculturalism. Well, you just diversity. read the legislation. Yeah, they've been, they've, they knew exactly what they were doing, and they wanted to bring it to this point. They wanted to create chaos, so out of that chaos, they can impose a more authoritarian system of governments and do away, probably physically, with anyone who's going to oppose them. It's been planned for a very long time in advance. It's not like multiculturalism is not working in Australia or in any other European country or European extension colony, America, New Zealand, Canada. It's working exactly as they wanted it to. It's creating chaos, disharmony, and it's destabilizing your country so they can enforce their will absolutely on you. So you will ask for their help in the future. Things will be so bad that you will be ready to accept authoritarian government, and that's what they want. Well, we've seen that with the, the radical left. Of course, I remember back in the, the Iraq war days, they, they hated government. They, they didn't want a surveillance state. But now I see prominent or so-called anarchist bloggers basically saying, we need more funding for Asia to monitor far-right extremists. Uh, we need more censorship of the, the internet, basically saying, oh, please, we need more Big Brother. Yeah, Big Daddy State. You know, it's, it's... And they've basically fallen for what you've just described, hook, line, and sinker, and they're not even aware of it. Yeah, well, it that actually, I think, links back into my my point of classism before because if you're an independent self-sufficient worker you could never support any sort of uh big brother system of government because you can look after yourself and you don't need anything like that but if you have gone to university and you've invested yourself emotionally and intellectually into all these ideas about equality and 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 you know social justice or the marxist version of social justice then you're basically useless. You have no skill. You're wholly dependent on a social welfare state. So of course you're going to be calling for more government power against those troublesome Nazi workers that won't obey your will. So yeah, it's, it's, it, I think that's a class issue as well, as, as well as a race issue. I mentioned the, the 457 visas, which, well, basically because 
the the government and society had told everyone to go to university and of course there was a skill shortage because the skills were demonized as i said before but we're also seeing because well we were having 190,000 migrants coming into australia a year and it's been reduced to 160,000 uh, per year which is well, if you work out the math there that's a slight uh, reduction but of course the the biggest opponents of that are the the business uh, community it's not it's not that there's not locals who are skilled for that it's that they want that flexibility that to to bring in whoever they they want yeah there's a great deal of money being made through the current immigration system you only need to look at the amount of houses these cheap new homes that these developers are building in thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of new homes. And Australian birth rates are so low that in the future, or even right now, who's going to buy those homes if we're not having children? I was just driving past Cranbourne the other day and I noticed they basically, they looked like the tiniest townhouses you could imagine. They're almost touching. Yes. Yeah. And I was amazed at how small they were. And that's not like in the inner city where most people live in in those tiny towns. That was in Cranbourne where there's constant new land releases. I was just... All of these Indian, uh, Pakistani, Arab, whatever they are, Chinese arrivals coming over and buying these homes, they're all moderately wealthy immigrants. And that's the point. That's what they want because they want to sell these homes to someone. And that's who buys the homes. But they're all being tricked they're being deluded into thinking that they can buy a nice piece of land in beautiful Australia and come over and live and start a new life and work and make a living for themselves and raise a nice family. They're not going to be able to do it because the whole the whole system's going to collapse in on itself. And there's not going to be a future for these Indians coming here and buying these cheap new homes. But they're tricked. There's ambassadors for these um, developers over in India setting up big stalls and banners trying to encourage Indians to immigrate into Australia to buy their cheap homes. And immigrants get these Indians, immigrants, get tricked into doing it, thinking there's a bright new future ahead in Australia when all there is is chaos and communism. Well, it's still the government that uh, builds the roads and other infrastructure and public transport, and governments are pretty crap at doing those things. I mean, for, well, a lot of these road projects, they become political wedge issues during the election. For example, Daniel Andrews, he ran on a platform of tearing up the East-West Link contract, a road that we still need. Mm -hmm. He won the election, so he tore that up, cost roughly the Victorian taxpayer a billion a billion dollars not to build a road that is a piece of infrastructure we needed if we're having all these new migrants in mm. and that we haven't had a well, starting to get train network upgrades that's but it, it's not keeping up and obviously the government hasn't hasn't sought this thought this through obviously the federal government uh, they decide immigration policy but it's the states that they have to build all the infrastructure and combine that with natural government incompetence. But the state, the state still has to find contractors to build all that infrastructure. The state doesn't have any builders on its payroll. Yes, directly, and so. uh, obviously Daniel Andrews, he's quite chummy with the with the unions, and we're seeing all these cost blowouts with what the the Westgate Tunnel, the the Metro tunnel and so it's not well it's great this is being built but it's being built at such a great expense well, and that's uh, that's another aspect where if you you can build all these houses and all these people can live there but how are they going to get from a to b it's already chaos it's so chaotic in and around melbourne what used to be a 45 minute drive is now two hours and it's in such poor traffic conditions it's almost little china but uh, Daniel, Daniel Andrews I don't think he knows what he's doing and my prediction is that there's going to be a major disaster or collapse of some sort during the development of all of, all of this infrastructure because all of the engineers are shit most of these engineers are re uh, recently arrived immigrants over, uh, who have come overseas, overseas in, to, to Australia to study and have ended up on permanent working visas or something. In, in Frankston, where I'm from, 
they dug up all of the roads around the train station and re-poured all of them to do up the train station area and built a new bridge and all of that. Oh, yes. I've, I've seen that myself. And basically, uh, they've rebuilt the train station, I'd say, three or four times. They, and it, yeah, it, it yeah. Hasn't, hasn't changed at all. They're still the same two platforms. But they dug up all the roads, poured the gutters. Now, it's a train station, right? So what's common around train stations? Buses. They poured the gutters and then opened it all up and said, we're ready to go. The roads weren't wide enough for buses to drive down. So they had to dig up all of the gutters and re pour the roads to fit buses. Yeah, because they've all got to go the buses because, down further yeah. where Blockbuster Video used to not, be. Not a single one of these engineers, while rebuilding this whole train station and road for like, infrastructure, thought, what about buses? Like, they built it first, and then it was too small for buses, so they pulled it apart and built it again at the expense of the taxpayer so buses would fit. And that just goes to show the degree of competence in, in, in you know the, the, these so-called new new age engineers are capable of so it's my prediction that some there's going to be a disaster of some sort it could be on the train line it could be a big building in the city something's going to fall down and that's just a prediction of mine it may come to pass it may not but if it does remember that i said it <laughs> well it was revealed that uh what daniel andrews he's he ha has not revealed which of the, the fire danger areas this summer. And there's also the cladding uh, uh, crisis with the new apartments. Uh, they've been kept secret, so people don't know if they're living in a apartment building that's going to, to move because they don't want to cause a, a mass panic. So you, if you live in one of these apartment towers, you could be in one that basically could slant one way. Well, they're all built as... Uh, 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 as cheaply as they possibly could be with all the most cheap materials and to the most minimum of standards to pass as a, a building or a building that's 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 passable by engineering or structural standards so yeah i wouldn't be surprised if there is some major disaster involving a building or partial co partial building collapse in the next few years in and around melbourne thanks for tuning in to wilmsfront Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.